Dosing is important. Dosing is basically the amount of energy received from the device. Too little dosing and no results. Too much dosing and you might negate the benefits. Don't worry, put your calculators away. The goal here is to have a basic understanding so you can ask a manufacturer good questions and you can use your device optimally. Let's first go through some of the more important definitions as these will be commonly heard in the photobiomodulation community. First, we'll review a few which we've already discussed. Wavelength is measured in nanometers. It determines the color of visible light. 660 nanometer would be a red color, whereas 450 nanometer would be blue. Wavelength is the greatest variable in determining penetration. Near infrared wavelength of 810 will penetrate deeper into the body than 660, even if 660 is given more power and more time. So what are these wavelengths made of? Photons. Photons are small packets of light. Think of photons as the building blocks of light. Photons are created when an atom is excited. Its electrons will then release that extra unstable energy in the form of light. At any point, there are literally trillions upon trillions of photons zooming all around us. Each atom will release a specific wavelength, which can be seen as a specific color to the eye. Dial chips or bulbs are made with specific atoms to release certain wavelengths. When many wavelengths are added together, the resulting color we perceive is white, as seen with the sun and household light bulbs. Keeping with the light bulb, let's turn to power. Just like your 60 watt light bulb at home, power is measured in watts or in milliwatts, which is one thousandth of a watt. A milliwatt is a relatively small amount of power. You may commonly hear of a company touting 900 watts of power. They are simply taking the watts of all the bulbs on the device and adding them together. By itself, this number does not mean much. Irradiance is a more appropriate number as it describes the amount of power over a specific area typically per square centimeter. If we had two panels of equal size and equal strength in watts per bulb, but one panel had twice as many bulbs, that panel would have about twice the irradiance or twice the amount of power per area. To determine the approximate irradiance or power per specific area at the surface of the device, we would simply add the power of all the bulbs together and divide it by the total square centimeters on the device. This is relatively easy if we are dealing with a rectangular device as opposed to a circular or oddly shaped device. For example, John has a panel with 100 bulbs. Each bulb has a power output of 2 watts or 2000 milliwatts for a total of 200 watts. The panel is 45 centimeters tall by 25 centimeters wide. Multiply 45 by 25 and we get 1,125 square centimeters or centimeters squared. We now take the total power of 200 watts and divide that by the 1,124 square centimeters, giving us 0.178 watts or 178 milliwatts per centimeter squared. There's other variables such as loss of power to take into account, but this is going to be pretty close. This 178 milliwatts per centimeter squared is a common number you'll see for a panel at the surface. For a pad or helmet, that number will be much lower, like 10 to 30 milliwatts per square centimeter. So you might think to go with the panel because it is so much more powerful, right? 
but we're leaving something very important out, and that's distance. The further away from the source of the power, the lower the power will be. This is because all those little photons end up running into molecules in the air and getting deflected and scattered. And with a panel or a full bed, we are typically positioning our body 6 to 24 inches away. So that's a lot of molecules to hit along the way. So how does that distance affect the power we receive? A 178 milliwatt at the surface of the device would drop almost in half at 6 inches to about 89 milliwatts and half again at 12 inches away to 45 milliwatts. So a pad or helmet with 25 milliwatts per centimeter squared, which is placed directly on the skin, would lose very little power and thus only be slightly less powerful than the panel. So this is fun, right? Hmm. So we now understand how much power is being put out by the device at the surface as well as at a distance, but this only tells us half the story. The next question is, how much power is being received over an amount of time? Let's use the example of the pad with 25 milliwatts per centimeter squared. How do I measure the total power being applied over a period of time. Why is this important? Because it takes time for all those photons to be absorbed into our bodies. We measure this with joules. Joules is the total energy of power or watts and time in seconds. So one joule equals one watt times one second. So if I had a pad which is 25 milliwatts per centimeter squared, placed directly on my skin, and I turned it on for exactly one second, I would receive 25 millijoules per centimeter squared. Because we are measuring power over time, we change the milliwatts to millijoules. Let's take the same example and do it for 10 seconds. We have a power output of 25 milliwatts per centimeter squared. Remember, that's the power coming from the source per a centimeter squared. We let that run for 10 seconds. 25 milliwatts per centimeter squared times 10 seconds equals 250 millijoules per centimeter squared. If we did this for 60 seconds, we get 1,500 millijoules per centimeter squared. If we did it for 10 minutes or 600 seconds, we get 15,000 millijoules per centimeter squared or 15 joules per centimeter squared. Remember, the one watt equals 1,000 milliwatts. Same with joules. One joule equals one millijoule. Let's do a similar example with the panel. Now, these numbers should be given to you by the manufacturer. So, if the surface is 178 milliwatts per centimeter squared, and we plan to stand six inches away from it, our skin will be receiving about 89 milliwatts per centimeter squared. If we did 10 seconds, that would be 89 milliwatts per centimeter squared times 10 seconds, equaling 890 millijoules per centimeter squared. If we did 60 seconds, 89 milliwatts per centimeter squared times 60 seconds equals 5,340 millijoules per centimeter squared, or 5.34 joules per centimeter squared. 10 minutes or 600 seconds would be 53,400 millijoules per centimeter squared or 53 joules per centimeter squared. Again, let's make clear these are just rough examples and rough numbers and many other variables play a role, but this gives you a basic understanding. 
Now, why are these numbers important? Why does 5 joules or 53 joules matter? Through hundreds of scientific studies, we know that there is an optimal amount of energy that our cells need in order to create a biological change, meaning the cells start producing more ATP. Unfortunately, the science has varying ranges, but we can agree on is that too small a dose of light does nothing for our cells, and too much light can negate the benefits or possibly have a deleterious effect. Fortunately, there's a wide optimal window, anywhere from 3 joules to 50 joules. So as long as you're following somewhat closely to the manufacturer recommendation, you'll be just fine. Generally, they will recommend you use 5 to 10 joules. So we need to add an extremely important variable to our math equation, and this will help everything make more sense. Penetration. Remember earlier when we discussed different wavelengths such as blue, red, near infrared, and how the wavelength was the most important factor in penetration with blue being the least penetrating and near infrared being the most penetrating. So if we had a lot of power, but it was blue wavelengths, it would still not penetrate much into the skin. If we had a high power of red, it still wouldn't penetrate much below the skin. And even with near infrared, the most penetrating, it will still only penetrate but so far into the body. So we need to find the sweet spot. How much energy is needed per wavelength to reach the appropriate depth? So in the last example of the panel, we had 89 milliwatts per centimeter squared at six inches away. That's the energy hitting the surface of the skin. But what's more important is the energy needed to penetrate into and below the skin. Now, once the light hits the skin, we have what we call reflection and scatter. Some of the light bounces off the skin, which is what we see. A lot of the light enters the skin, but quickly scatters in all directions. This is good for the skin, but what about the deeper underlying tissue like muscles, bone, and brain? What we know is close to 90% of the light is lost after the very first centimeter of depth. Meaning, if we measured 89 milliwatts per centimeter squared at the 6 inch mark for 10 minutes, 89 times 600 seconds, which equals 53,400 millijoules per centimeter squared, or 53 joules per centimeter squared, only 10% is penetrating past the initial first centimeter, which equals 5,340 millijoules per centimeter squared, or 5.34 joules per centimeter squared. And only 534 millijoules per centimeter squared, or 0.534 joules per centimeter squared, is making it to the third centimeter of depth. Let's remember that only near infrared is making it this far. The other colors have already gone as far as they could. So when we look at a muscle, let's say a bicep, the surface of the bicep is just under the skin and rather shallow at about half a centimeter, depending on other factors such as fat cells. The surface of the muscle would be rather easy to reach with the light. But what about the middle of the muscle? Obviously, that depends on muscle mass, but to make this easier, we'll say the middle is two centimeters deep. Ideally, we want to get about five joules of energy to that area. So we'd have to put 50 joules of energy onto the skin surface. Again, there's many more variables such as tissue type, blood, tissue water that will also affect absorption. But that's getting way beyond this discussion. Generally speaking, you can follow the manufacturer recommended time. Typically, this is 7 to 15 minutes for panels at 6 inches away, 12 to 20 minutes at 12 inches away, or for a pad system, generally 
15 to 30 minutes. And again, with the pad, it's touching the skin. Are you ready for another curveball? Let's say you have deeper issues beyond the penetrating depth of near infrared, which is about four centimeters, arguably. Just because the light does not directly reach the area of concern doesn't mean there aren't biological changes occurring. Remember from chapter one, we discussed the many benefits of light. A few of them were vasodilation, increased blood flow, increased oxygen, increased lymphatic flow, gene transcription where cells are literally communicating with each other, angiogenesis, which is new blood capillaries being formed, stem cell differentiation. All of these primary and secondary actions affect not just the immediate area, but can greatly affect and benefit tissue on the opposite side of the body. This is also true if you are putting light on a localized area of the body. The light will travel to other areas. So it's not always necessary to put the light exactly where the problem spot may be. As an example, your child has a broken arm and is wearing a cast. The light won't penetrate the cast or clothing for that matter to reach into the skin and down to the bone. But light can be placed above and below the cast. The light can be placed on the lymph nodes as well. If there's peripheral neuropathy, for example, light can be placed on the extremities, but also on the nerves in the spine that lead to the hands and feet. One, remember that dose equals power density or irradiance times time. Two, without the correct dosing, your device will not give you optimal results. And three, you will want to account for whether you are treating superficial or deep areas of your body when calculating dose. And always remember that wavelength, be it near infrared, red, or blue, is the most important factor in determining depth of penetration. Near infrared will always penetrate the furthest and is best for issues deeper than the skin. Red is next and is ideal for skin issues as well as tissues just beneath the skin surface.